Father, we love you truly. Thank you for today. Thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for your presence. We trust that you are in the midst of us. We thank you for the praise songs that we got to praise you to this morning. You deserve it. Help us to not let praise leave our lips. Help us to think of new songs and new ways to sing you, sing to you as we travel about our business and go about our day and the rest of our week. Help us to think about how we can praise you and do something for you this week. Father, there's a lot of fear going on. Father, help us to be truth. Help us to be love. Help us to uh, help somebody who might be dealing with the fear. And Father, we thank you right now in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about restoration. Being restored. And in case we need a refresher on what that means, I'll go ahead and read a definition. To bring back into existence or use. To reestablish. To bring back to an original or normal condition. To put someone back in former position or role. To make restitution of or give back. To bring back to health, good spirits. Oh, we need that this morning. Lord, help us. To return something lost, stolen, or etc. to its owner. So that's basically a quick definition of what restoration means. Some of those things that uh, I was looking at. To bring back to its uh, normal or original condition. Some of those times we uh, deal with things in our life where we need things to go back to uh, a normal position, right? So let's get back to normal. Let's get things back to the way they've always been or let's get things back to what we understand as normal. Because sometimes normal helps us uh, in our lives to, to cope with situations. When you have a semblance of normalcy, you can better deal with your surroundings. But when things are always constantly changing rapidly, it's, it's hard to settle into a normal position. I don't know if you've ever been into a, uh, if you've ever gone offshore fishing or you've ever been on a boat in general, but once those waves start going, your boat starts a-rocking. You ever noticed that before if you've ever been on a boat? Maybe it was a... A cruise ship or maybe it was just the ferry to Galveston but anytime you've ever been on a boat you notice once those waves start to rock and it's hard to it's hard to even walk right isn't it you know some people even get seasick you ever heard of that yeah. or you've ever been seasick I've been seasick one time and it was when we went offshore fishing and it was man them waves were getting and then my stomach couldn't handle it because it wasn't normal to it and it was constantly being jostled. That's why usually whenever you get on a roller coaster or something, you, you, if you've just eaten, you, you feel real sick and sometimes you even throw up, right? It's because your stomach is not used to that constant churning and moving. But you, you, once it gets back to normal, oh man, now, now it's okay. Now I'm fine. Now I can walk right. Or I don't know if you've ever done one of those dizzy tests. Maybe you have to think back a long time ago when you were a kid, but somebody will spin you around, 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 and then whenever they let go, you're, your world's spinning, right? And you can get dizzy, and you could even fall down. Well, sometimes we need to be brought back to a state of normalcy because once all those crazy things start swirling around, it gets a little rocky, you get a little twirled up, and you get mixed up in your head, don't you? We need God to bring restoration to our lives in every way possible. Because once things start getting crazy, it's kind of hard to keep your balance in all things. It's hard to keep your balance in every aspect of life if it's constant chaos, constant turmoil. You get kind of rocked off your rocker, so to speak. So we have to consciously and constantly be praying for rest restoration in our lives. God, help things to be calm. Help things to be smooth. Help there to be peace. Help there to be love. Help things to be without chaos. Because the devil's the one who's trying to bring in chaos. 
And when he does that, it causes our world to start spinning out of control. And if you never settle it back down, or if you never prayed for that to be settled back down, you will continue in a state of unbalance. And, it, and you will not succeed in your Christian walk if you are conscient, constantly being in a state of imbalance. You won't be able to walk that straight and narrow. Just think about this. You've all heard of the sobriety test. People who have gotten drunk and the cop says, all right, I want you to walk a straight line. And for those drunk people, it's really hard to walk a straight line unless you're a pro at it, unless you're an alcoholic. You've done it many times. But for most people, if, you, if you've drank too much alcohol, you start to kind of move a little bit of wobbly like this. That's why they make you walk that straight line. And the devil knows it too. That's why he sends us that chaos, because he knows it makes it hard for us to walk that straight and narrow as well. He knows that once the chaos starts surrounding you, you start to wobble a little bit as well. You start to get out of that narrow path as well. You're not walking the straight and narrow as easy. The more chaos, the more you start to wobble. And as you see the chaos start to ensue, you should be doing what? Pray, right? I'm hearing it softly. Y'all feel free to shout that out, okay, for everybody else to hear. We need to be prayers, prayer warriors. we got to pray for our situations. We've got to pray for our country. As we see things start going into chaos, I don't know about y'all, but have you watched any of the news lately? It's kind of chaotic, isn't it? Everybody's getting in an uproar. Everybody's getting scared, right? I saw a comparison of the coronavirus in comparison to when H1N1, y'all remember that? Yes. There were several thousands of people who were infected by that. And several thousands of people who died from that. But it, the, we weren't as crazy about it for some reason. Nobody was as scared back when that was going on. Because the news wasn't shooting it out at you every five seconds. Hey, you, know, you, go, oh, you gotta be scared. You gotta, oh, you gotta do all this. You gotta do all oh. this. And everybody was fine. But when, once everybody starts talking about it and everybody's getting scared about it, then it starts getting, oh man, what's going on? My boat's starting to rock a little bit. You start getting rocked out of imbalance. So we need to be able to know how to fight back against that chaos, right? Of course, we are not to, to dismiss it all. That ain't going to do nothing to me. That ain't, yeah, that's nothing. We need to have a mentality of, okay, well, I'm going to do what I need to do, but I'm not going to be in fear about it. I'm going to take the necessary precautions, but I'm not going to be fearful, right? God wants us to be smart, okay, right? He wants us to be smart. Yes. But he also wants us to not live in fear. Amen. So don't be scared about all the stuff that's going on. Yes, we're taking the necessary precautions here. Yes, we sprayed everything down with Lysol. We're just doing our due diligence. But I don't want you to be misunderstood about the situation. We're not living in fear. We're just taking the precautionary measures that they're telling us to do, and we're just going to do that, but we're not going to live in fear. Amen. Lord, help us not to live in fear. Let's go ahead and get into the Scriptures. Acts 3, 19 through 21. That was from our Scripture verse this morning. Repent. Okay, now I want to stop right there already. Repent is a turning away from uh, your thoughts towards sin. So when you were an old man and when you were dead in sin, you used to like it. You used to want to sin. You used to couldn't wait till the next time you sinned. But when you repent, you're changing your mindset about how you view sin. Now you hate it. Now you don't want it. Now you want to stay away from it. When you do sin, you're grieved. You hate it. Man, I feel bad about it. I feel sick to my stomach. I don't want to do that anymore. And then once you've changed your mind, your actions and your words will start to change as well. Everything will start to change to what is good when you truly repent. And then he says, Therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Blotted out by Jesus. 
and what He did on the cross. So that times of refreshing may come. Man, I want to be refreshed. Anybody want to be refreshed this morning? Yeah. I need a refreshing. So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Man, His presence brings refreshing. Was anybody refreshed when we were praising them praise songs this morning? Yeah. Anybody? Yes. Some people, right? Some of you got your hands down, but I was. I was refreshed. I needed those praise songs. Anybody else right there with me? Yes. But we're getting that refreshing not from the song, but from His presence. Do you know that it says that He dwells in the midst of the praises of His people? He dwells where praises are. He was with us this morning. I believe He's still with us. Thank you, Lord. Refresh us this morning. We need a little refreshing. And that He may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things. Man, I can't wait for that. I can't wait for the restoration of all things. Which God has spoken by the mouth of all His holy prophets since the world began. He's been talking about it for a long time. Ever since Adam and Eve messed up, they started the chaos. All right? If Adam and Eve would have just stayed true and not ate of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would have been fine. We would have been fine. Everything would have been fine. We wouldn't even be thinking about no coronavirus or any other virus that's out there. We wouldn't be thinking about anything but good things. But thankfully, He's going to restore it. He's going to bring a restoration to this earth and us. He's going to restore all things. Aren't you glad about that? Maybe. He's going to restore everything. And He can restore things right now as well. He can restore relationships. He can restore your health. He can restore your faith. He can restore your love. He can restore your peace and comfort. He can restore everything. Isn't that good? Yes. You may have lost all of those things and more. He can restore it. You may have lost all your finances. You may have lost your family members. He can restore all things. Now, you, may not, you might have to wait a little while because some of your family members are dead and gone, but some of them are in heaven, aren't they? Yeah. You will get to see them again, won't you? He will restore that relationship again. Thank you, Lord. He can restore all things, so believe for that. Believe that all things can be restored. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Joel 2.25 and I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. Okay? These are little things that take care of uh, crops, that eat crops and all that kind of thing. But nevertheless, there are these little canker worms and caterpillars and palmer worms and locusts in our lives as well. And the devil will send different things and situations to destroy things from your life. He's come to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what the devil does. He's come to take everything away from you. Did you know that? I think most people do. The devil wants to take away everything. But God is the one who brings restoration. God will be the one to restore. Thank you, Lord. Psalm 23, verse 3. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Thank you, Lord. Anybody need their soul restored this morning? Mind, body, mind, soul, and emotions. It's actually, sorry, your mind, will, and emotions. You need any of that restored this morning? He will do such a thing. Let's go to Psalm 51, verse 12. 
Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Sometimes we need to remember back when we first received that salvation. When we first realized, man, I am saved from my sin. I have been born again. I have the Holy Spirit living in the inside of me. We had such a joy. Do you remember that when you first were saved? Anybody remember? Yeah. Sometimes it might you might have to think a long time ago. I know I know the day I know the year that was for me it was in 2006 that I was truly saved, truly born again, and I remember the joy that I had. But sometimes we need to get refreshed in that. Sometimes that needs to be restored back to our minds because this world is hard, and that's just the truth of it, folks. The world is hard. And there's a lot of things out there that make it hard, right? Right. But He can restore that joy back to you. And the joy comes from the Lord, not anything else. We, get, we think that other things give us joy, but that's not joy. That's happiness. God gives us the joy. And through His salvation, we can have it. And it's upholded by His generous Spirit. He's so generous. He gives us so much, doesn't He? Thank you, Lord. Psalm 60, verse 1. O oh God, You have cut, cast us off. You have broken us down. You have been displeased. Sometimes the Lord gets displeased by our actions. And sometimes He's got to break us down. Sometimes He's got to. Sometimes He's got to punish us. Sometimes He's got to get us out of our own mindsets. Sometimes we think we do the things that get done. Sometimes we think, oh, it's only because of me that that got done. We have a little bit of pride issue, don't we? But it is only because of Him that anything is ever done and anything that is good comes from Him. So thank you, Lord. But it says, Oh, restore us again. Exclamation mark. Restore us again. Yes, you've allowed these things to happen. Yes, I've been broken down. I feel like I'm cast off. Yes, I know I displeased you. Please forgive me and restore me again. Restore me to the state in which you want me to be in. Help me, Lord. He will. If you cry out for it. If you really want it. He will do it. Anybody thankful for that this morning? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Now, I'm going to read three of them rapidly here. Psalm 80, verse 3, and I'm going to read verse 7 and 19 as well. Restore us, O God, cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved. Restore us, O God of hosts, cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved. Restore us, O Lord, God of hosts, cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved. Psalm 80, folks, he says it three times. Three times for us to catch in our brains, hey, anytime he repeats something, we need to remember Restore us, Lord. Restore us. Psalm 85, verse 4. Restore us, O God of our salvation, and cause your anger towards us to cease. Sometimes he does get angry. Sometimes he gets mad. We make him mad. You know, sometimes Brill and David get on my ever-loving nerves. They, it just seems like they just keep doing things that make me mad sometimes. And sometimes it's hard for me. It seems like my level of anger just keeps rising and rising. Lord, cause that anger to come back down. Help it to come back down. But he gets mad too. He gets mad at the things that we do. We do things that displease him all the time. Now, he's not looking just to be mad. He's just not mad about every little thing. Oh, you did that one thing wrong. Now I'm mad at you and I'm about to slam you down. No, he... He is, oh, He is so long-suffering towards us. He loves us so much. He's so patient with us. But sometimes we just keep poking Him. We just keep poking Him. And there's only so many times you get poked before that anger comes out. 
You can't just get poked over and over and expect nothing to ever happen. And that's what we do when we sin. We keep poking him. And every time we poke him, it makes him a little bit more angry. And then before you know it, here comes that hammer. That's it. I've had enough. Here it comes. Time for punishment. The other day, I, I gave Brill so many warnings. Oh, goodness. Because I don't like to. I don't know if you've ever raised a kid before. I think most most of you have out there. I don't like spanking my kids. I don't, but I do it because I know that's what the Bible tells me to do. But that don't mean I like it. I don't enjoy it. I don't want to have to do it. I try to give so many chances. But there just comes a point in time where you have to or they're not ever going to learn anything. And it, we were in the car the other day and uh, she just kept doing something over and over. And I told her, Brill, you need to stop right now. First warning. Brill, all right, this is your second warning. I don't want to have to tell you again. You better stop or the next time you're going to get a spanking. She did it less than a minute after I said that. I mean to tell you, talk about defiance. And she couldn't use the word I forgot because we all know that one, huh? Oh, I forgot. I, I forgot. No, she knew exactly what the punishment was fixing to be. So me, as a loving father, I had to discipline. I had to to teach her. I had to, not because I'm mean, but because I love her. But there does come a point in time where God says, that's it. That's enough. Here comes that hammer. It's coming down. Here comes that foot. I just had to kill red wasp, folks. It goes with my sermon, though, doesn't it? It just has to come down. Sometimes the foot comes down and you're right underneath it, though. Right? I want to do my best not to make him angry because he has all the means at his disposal of punishing me. And I don't want to be on his bad side. Whoa, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It is. Whoa, it is. You will be saying whoa when you get punished. I don't want to be punished. I want, if I mess up, I want to be a quick repenter. Oh, I messed up. Sorry, Lord. Please forgive me. I'm going to try my best not to do that again. But I'm not going to exist in that mess up. I'm not going to keep messing up and think nothing ever is going to happen to me. Because I'm on God's side and God loves me. He's going to just let me get away with everything. Wrong again. <laughs> Wrong. Matter of fact, He loves those who he loves is the ones he's going to discipline. So you better expect it. If you keep messing up, you better expect that punishment to come down on you. And it'll come. And it might be something you just did not want to happen. Man, I wish he would have punished me any other way but that one thing. See, he knows exactly how to punish you. See, we as parents, we have to try to figure out ways. All right, well, that spanking didn't work. Let me try Let me try this uh, grounding. Oh, the grounding didn't work. Let me try taking away the candy. Oh, the candy didn't work. Let me try this. You can't go outside and play with Oh, that didn't work. Let me try the friends. That didn't work. We're trying to figure out ways to punish because sometimes it just don't work. But God knows exactly what kind of punishment to dole out to you. And it might be the thing that you were dreading. I don't want that to happen to me. But if you keep messing up, you keep sinning, you keep testing him, he's going to give it to you. Not because he's mean, but because he loves you. Because he's trying to keep you from that thing that you keep doing. Because he knows the thing that you're doing is leading you to death. Because sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Anybody remember reading that scripture? That's what the truth of the matter is. He's trying to keep you from death. Anybody thankful for that this morning? Amen. Thank you, Lord. All right, let's go to Matthew 17, uh, 11 through 13. 
Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. So somehow, God implanted John the Baptist with some type of mantle, the same type of thing that Elijah passed on to Elisha. So you got to go back to the Old Testament to read about that story. But nevertheless, somehow God gave John the Baptist this same type of mantle that Elijah had as his prophet. And he was the one in the wilderness crying out, saying, Here comes the way of the Lord. Talking about Jesus' way was coming. Jesus was on the way, and he was making way for Jesus. He was basically uh, somebody out there just saying, dun, 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 here comes the Lord. That's basically what John the Baptist's job was. So when he was saying that he was coming to restore all things, he was basically meaning Jesus was coming right around behind him to come restore all things. Thank you, Jesus. Mark 3, 1 through 6. And he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Step forward. Then he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. And when he had looked around at them with anger, Jesus was mad. Being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out. And his hand was restored as whole as the other one. Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him, how they might kill Jesus. Because he healed a man on the Sabbath. Jesus was angry at their hardness of heart. Come on, guys. You, what do you mean you're going to get mad at me for trying to help somebody? Who cares if it's on the Sabbath? I'm trying to help this man. Y'all have a hard heart. Sometimes he's got to work on our hearts too. Lord, help us not have a hard heart. Help us to have a soft, mushy-gushy heart of love to where we care enough about people to help them. Lord, help us to have your heart. That's what we need to truly pray. Lord, help us to have your heart for your people. And I believe if we pray that honestly and often, He will give us that heart. Which heart would you rather have this morning? A hard one or a heart full of love? I believe love is the best option. Galatians 6.1 Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. He's telling us to be the ones to help restore those who are lost. The one, well, he's telling us to help restore those brothers of ours who have gone out of the sheepfold and who are doing their own thing, he has told us to try to, to restore them. Okay? If we're so spiritual, which hopefully we, we are, we need to be the ones to try to restore them. And we need to try our best to do it in the spirit of gentleness, but also considering ourselves, lest we be tempted as well and brought after that same thing that led them away. Whatever it is, we need to make sure that we're prayed up before we go try to convince them to come back because we let's say they're over there drinking. Hey, brother, I want to see you back in church. Well, hey, just sit here with me for a little while, drink a little bit with me, and we'll talk about it. All right, I'll do that. And you get to drinking, and next thing you know, you're spending every waking hour over there drinking, and you ain't going to church either. That's why he says, consider yourself, lest you also be tempted. If you don't think you can handle that type of environment, don't you go to it. 
If you know you have a temptation of alcohol, then don't you go to it. You let somebody else restore that person because that's the sin that you have a hard time with. And he understands that. He knows. He knows we got to refrain from certain situations because it's just too tempting for us. So let somebody else who's not as this tempted go deal with that. But nevertheless, if we have a spirit of gentleness, maybe God will help us bring some of those people back. If they're willing to come back. Sometimes people get such a hard heart they don't ever want to come back. And that's just the sad reality of it. But as long as we try to reach out with that spirit of gentleness, we might be able to pull some of them back. Amen. Lord, help us. I'm getting close to the end, y'all. I want to talk about Job real quick. Now, I suggest if you haven't ever read the book of Job, and I talk about it often, but I suggest you go read it. It's about 42 chapters. It's quite a long book, but it's a good book. And from what I've studied, it shows that that was the book that was written first, even before the book of Genesis was wrote. Although the book of Genesis contains the things that happened before the book of Job, the book of Job was the first thing written and contained and passed down. So if that was the first thing written, there must be something important about this book. There must be something I need in this book that will help me get through my life. And there is, folks. You go read that book, and I guarantee you it will give you a different outlook on life. Amen. And the next time something bad happens to you, you can say, Whoo, I read that book of Job. I know God's going to help me in the end. And that's what I'm going to read to you right now, the end. I want you to go back and read it for yourself, but I'm going to read the end. All right? And let you see what happened. So we're going to go to Job 42, 10, verse 17. And the Lord restored Job's losses. Now, previously, before all that, God allowed the devil to attack him. God allowed the devil to strike out everything in his life but his life. He said, all that is yours Everything that you can do in your capabilities, you can do against Job, but kill him. Can you imagine God giving the devil that much car blanche? You can do whatever you want to him. That's what God said. God gave the devil permission. Now that's kind of hard and upsetting to some of us. What do you mean? Well, he's giving the devil the same thing to us. The same thing is available for the devil to do to us. The only difference is, is God protects us. God will protect you from the things that will kill you for the most part until it's your time to die. And he will protect you from all the other things, but sometimes the devil is allowed to attack you and it is successful. Sometimes he will attack your health and you will get sick and you might have a disease or whatever. Sometimes he's allowed to kill somebody in your family Sometimes he's allowed to take your finances. Whatever it is, the devil has that free reign on us. And that's what he gave to Job. So Job had a lot of losses. He lost all of his family members except for his wife. He lost all of his livelihood. He had terrible hell. His friends were coming against him. His wife was coming against him. He had it hard, folks. If anybody ever had it hard... It was Job. But it says here in verse 10, And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. He prayed for his friends. The ones who were coming against him, Job prayed for them. And it says God restored all of his losses when he prayed for them. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. See, God's not going to allow the devil to attack and not restore what was taken. God will allow it, and he's going to allow it to all of us. Nobody's off limits. So the next time th something happens to you, don't think it a strange thing because God has given the devil access to attack you. All right? 
But remember, we talked about it last week. That trial by fire, that test by fire, it's for your good. Remember? Count it all joy. It's going to be good for you. It's your blessing. We see right here, Job was tested by fire as well. And God restored to him twice as much as he had before. Then all his brothers and all his sisters and all those who had been his acquaintances before came to him and ate food with him in his house. And they consoled him and comforted him for all the adversity that the Lord had brought upon him. Each one gave him a piece of silver and each one and each a ring of gold. Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. Now to a farmer, this might sound more appealing, but this is riches back in them days. This would probably be the equivalent of you hitting the lottery, all right? Let me just try to uh, rephrase it in a different modern day term. It's like God just saying, here you go, here's abundance of riches. God blessed him more than what he had, even times two. He also had seven sons and three daughters. Now, if you go back and read, you'll see that his sons and daughters were killed. Now, God has blessed him with more sons and daughters. Seven sons, even. Seven <laughs> sons. Now, you've got to think like a man to understand the goodness of this. But a man thinks about leaving behind a, a generation that can carry on his name. A man thinks, I want a son to come, and, and I want a son when, he, when, when a, uh, your wife is pregnant, you pray for a son. Now, not to be mean to any women out there, but that's just kind of the thought process of a man because you want to leave behind a legacy of some kind. You feel like whenever you have a son, you got your own piece of yourself left behind you when you die. And that's just kind of the thought process. So God gave him seven sons. Now seven means divine perfection and completeness. So whenever God gave him seven, he blessed him to the abundance with sons. Now from his point of view, that is a huge blessing. And he also gave him three daughters as well. Thank you, Lord. And he called the name of the first Jemima. And the name of the second, Keziah. And the name of the third, Karen Kapuk. And in all the land were found no women so beautiful as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. He got to live even longer to see his four generations. So Job died old and full of days. Isn't that what everybody's hope is in life? That you can see your, your children grow up and they have their grand, you have grandchildren, and then boom, they have grandchildren. It just kept going. He kept, God kept blessing him. So although he had to go through all of that torment, and when you go back and read the book of Job, you'll see he went through a lot of problems. God blessed his latter end. And I bet you, after it was all over, he was thankful he went through it. Because God was able to bless him to this fullest extent. Because he went through that trial of fire, because he didn't curse God, because he stood and had the faith that God required him to have, God blessed him abundantly. I don't know about y'all, but that sounds pretty good to me. You might have to go through your own trial of fire, though. But nevertheless, God will restore unto you what the devil has taken away. Some kind of way. You might even have to die to see that restoration take place. But nevertheless, God will restore. And I'm thankful for that. So don't quit. God is going to restore your peace, your sleep, your joy, your health, your family, your finances, your spirituality, God will restore it all if you pray for it, if you ask Him, if you stand up to that trial of fire and succeed. 
He's going to help you. Because our God is good. Isn't he? He is good. He is goodness itself. And He does help us. Whether we see it or not. He's always working, remember. He's always behind the scenes. And He will restore things in your life. I'm so thankful for that. Thank you, Jesus. If you got Jesus in your life, you should praise Him this morning. Does anybody need restoration? Amen. Does anybody need to be restored in some kind of way today? Amen. Maybe it's your mind. Maybe your mind's been a little foggy lately. Maybe you've been dealing with some things that are just hard to think about. Maybe you've had a hard past and there's things that you can't ever get rid of in your mind and you... I need to be restored, Lord. Is there anybody out there that needs to be restored right now? You know it. You know if you need to be restored. Maybe there's something in your body right now that's it's acting up. Maybe you got something going on in your body that's hurting you, and it needs to be restored. Maybe there's a relationship that you know that needs to be restored back to you. A friend or a family member. Somebody that you just wish that you could talk with again. Maybe there's something that you're dealing with that needs to be restored. Well, as we pray right now, I want you to talk to God in yourself, with, just by yourself, and pray for Him to help restore that. Whatever it is. You know what you need. You know and He knows. But let's just close in prayer with this. <laughs> Father, right now we're asking for restoration in all things. We know that You're the one that can do it. And that's why we're calling out to You right now, wherever we're at, with whatever situation that we're dealing with, which is always different from somebody else, Father, we're asking right now that You please be the one to restore it. Father, we thank You right now that You are the one who can do such a thing. You can restore all things. And we believe in that, Father. And we trust in that fact. And we know that Your will shall be done. And we rest comfortably on that truth. Comfortably that Your will shall be done. And we thank You for it. And we love You. And we are in agreement with one another, Father, right now for what each one of us are dealing with. Father, we're asking that Your will be done in all of our circumstances. Restore whatever it is that You have a desire to restore in our lives. And we thank You right now ahead of time and believe that even if we don't see it happening, we know that You're out there moving and working even when we don't see it. And we thank You for that right now. In Jesus' holy name, Amen. Amen.